morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Davide. I'm a production engineer at Facebook, and this talk is about the work we do with Stream. Uh, here's the agenda for today. We'll start with a quick introduction about our infrastructure. We'll deep dive into what we do specifically with Sandos and how we use it. Uh, we'll talk about how we contribute to Upstream and how you can do, contribute to Upstream, leveraging CentOS Stream as well. And finally, we'll close with some words around deployment and management. So let's go over infrastructure. Facebook has a lot of machines. We have millions of servers across the globe in multiple data centers. All of these machines are physical machines. All of these machines run CentOS. Um, and, all, and that has been true for many years, since, uh, as far as I know, since the, since the company was started. Uh, and the common theme throughout this is that we try to manage this fleet in a crazy way, and we try to leverage open source software as much as we can. Uh, I work on the operating systems team. My team manages the bare metal experience of the fleet. We treat the operating system as a platform in the sense that uh, we try to build a common layer that other teams at the company can leverage directly. Uh, teams that run directly on bare metal will interface directly with the OS. Teams that run on the container platform will interface with the container platform, which itself runs on top of CentOS. Uh, and the containers, by the way, also run CentOS. Uh, teams at Facebook are expected to be responsible for their own machines and their own services. So our team will open X as kind of a consulting partner where we will build tooling and try to set up systems in a way that can be useful and solve problems. And then it's up to the individual owners of, say, MySQL or the web servers or whatever to make sure that their services work properly, they're monitored, and so on. Uh, a constant theme throughout this is that we try to build our infrastructure on top of an open source foundation. Uh, there is no point in reinventing the wheel, and we very much want to try and leverage the work that the community has done and contribute to the community as well as much as we can. Uh, so we use, we use Linux, obviously. We use CentOS. We use the standard RHEL packaging stack. Uh, a lot. We use Chef for config management, and we use systemd throughout the infrastructure. And I'll I'll talk about all of these components more closely in a little bit. Uh, but first, I want to say a few words about why we actually do this. Um, uh, we I had these slides in my talks for quite a while now, and but I think it's important to go over these uh, in general. We we try as much as possible to work with open source because we think the community is where the innovation tends to happen, and the community is what ends up setting the direction. If we can work with the community on features, try to make our use case understood, try to better understand what the community wants, we can make things better for Facebook, but we can also make things better for the world at large. Uh, and while Facebook prides itself on moving fast, the reality is that the community often moves even faster. Uh, it is quite common for us to find out that we have a problem we start analyzing it and trying to figure out what we should do. And then we find out that it's already been solved by the community at large. And we can either import the solution as is, or we can make minor changes, contribute back, and solve the problem for everybody. We don't need to write anything ourselves. And at the same time, the fact that we can leverage the community's work means also that we can share our work. Uh, we can share our work. We can share our code. We can share the maintenance scene. We can have other people contribute to it. And from an engineering standpoint, at least for me, it is much more pleasant to know that I am working on something that other folks can actually leverage and use and maybe make the life a little bit better. Um, there's a talk I, I gave in the DEF CONF in man, 2017. That was a while ago. Um, it's still fairly relevant, though. So if you're interested more into our approach here, uh, you're welcome to watch it. Uh, I left talks referenced throughout this presentation because this is only a 40 minute slot. So, um, I'll, I'll try to not go into too much details in things that have already been covered in the past. Uh, now, let's talk about CentOS. Uh, but first, before we talk about CentOS, let's talk about why we actually run CentOS. Um, as I said, we've been running CentOS for quite a while. I've been at Facebook since 2012. Uh, and at the time, we were running Cent5. And now we're running CentOS 3.8. Um, the, there's been some constant themes, though, throughout this. Um, CentOS gives us a lot of things that we like. Uh, and it also gives us the ability to fix the things we don't necessarily like or that don't necessarily apply to our environment. Uh, well, first thing first, CentOS gives us stable releases. It gives us a stable base that we can build upon that is known to work, that is known to be well tested and gated. Um, note that this is true both for CentOS Linux and for CentOS Stream, because they have effectively the same gating. Uh, so from that point of view, nothing has actually changed. Uh, CentOS also gives us binary compatibility. Uh, binary compatibility is very important 
because binary compatibility means that if you go on a live system and you run DNF upgrade, you can be certain to a very high degree that the services you are currently running on the machine will keep running on the machine, that you won't need to reboot, that you won't need to kill random things for stuff to keep working because glibc suddenly changed the way it works. Uh, this is what makes it possible for us to do minor updates of the fleet live throughout the life cycle of the system by just sharding them out. Uh, CentOS also obviously gives us security updates, um, which is something else that is clearly very important, but it's also something else that ties in with the binary compatibility, because without that, we would not be able to apply this live in a safe way. Uh, CentOS gives us good tooling and tooling that is very well understood. Things like the packaging stack at this point are very mature. There are tools that have been around for a long time. There are tools that people know how to work with, know how to contribute with, and make changes if needed. And finally, CentOS is part of a larger ecosystem. Uh, CentOS itself is a fairly conservative distribution that it doesn't carry that many packages. Um, and the same is true for RHEL, because it's effectively the same kind of packages. But it doesn't carry that much beyond core system packages. Uh, but because CentOS is part of the Fedora ecosystem, we also have access to everything that is packaged in Appel. And we also have access to everything that is packaged in Fedora. And if something is missing from Appel or Fedora, we can work with those communities to make it available. And that is something that has been extremely valuable throughout the years. So the approach we've generally taken at Facebook is that we, we run a CentOS base, and then we backport on top of it what we end up needing uh, from Fedora Rawhide. So these are generally things that are system plumbing, either packages that we work on very closely with upstream. So we want to know that we are running the latest, the latest master or the latest stable release so that if we make any changes, we can contribute them back without having to worry about backporting or various um, system and low-level packages that we work on. Um, we try to publish our backports on GitHub, um, uh, and I'll talk more about this later uh, and how we're trying to make this easier to consume. The way this tends to be written is that we have a macro to gate Facebook-specific stuff and configuration, so the packages themselves can also be useful to people that are not Facebook. Um, we found throughout the years that the approach of combining CentOS with this, what we call this fast thin layer, this layer of packages that we backport, gives us a stable distribution that can move as fast as we need and at the pace we need in the various components. Um, the other thing we do uh, that deviates from CentOS proper is that we don't run the CentOS kernel. Uh, the CentOS kernel is a very stable kernel, but it tends to be based on a fairly old kernel version compared to what is currently in Linux 3. It's also a kernel that tends to have a lot of backports. Because our kernel team does a lot of development on many, on many features and subsystems, and they do all of this development in master, it's a lot easier for us to just run effectively Linux 3 or something close to Linux 3 rather than doing work uh, to then backport these to an older kernel. Uh, and we do a lot of kernel work. Uh, we do a lot of kernel work both on specific features and subsystems and general fixes. All of this is work that doesn't really happen internally at Facebook. It's all work that happens outside in the open. Um, and the, while there is an internal development branch of the kernel, it's effectively used mostly for staging patches and make it easier um, to roll changes. Um, the way this works in practice is that we tend to have two kernels concurrently in the fleet, one that's stable and one that is development. Uh, and then we'll, we slowly update them uh, and move them on. But they tend to be very close, very close to mainline. Uh, some examples of features that we worked on throughout the years that we continue to work on uh, are the ButterFS file system, uh, the resource control features leveraging C group 2. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of work on resource control lately, and resource control also ties with ButterFS because ButterFS is what effectively makes it possible to have reliable I.O. control. Um, within resource control, there's also been a lot of work lately around PSI, uh, which is a feature in the kernel that allows you effectively allows you to predict the future and tell whether a process is likely to um in the near term. So you can do something about it before the kernel invokes the um killer and kills it. Um, and finally, we do a lot of work on BPF and the BPF toolset. Uh, this is just a short rundown. There's a lot more stuff happening in the kernel. Um, we have tooling that we use to roll out kernels and test them and make sure this is done safely. Um, these days, it's actually the same tooling we use for the operating system. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this later. Um, there's an old blog post I linked there if you're interested in learning more about the kernel. Uh, another component that I mentioned before that we work on is systemd. Um, as I said, we do a lot of work on systemd and with systemd. Uh, so we try to follow the systemd upstream, and we maintain a systemd backport that's available in the repo I mentioned. 
Um, the way we do work with system D is that we'll take the latest stable release, we'll add whatever patches we have in development that either have been already submitted upstream and accepted, or that are currently in review. Uh, and then we'll feed it to our CI CD pipeline, uh, which will run it through a battery of tests. It will also run it against tests against our container suite, it tends to stress things quite a bit. And then if we find any issues, we report them back upstream or fix them more directly. And then we just roll it out. Uh, we've started using SystemD at Facebook when we were doing the Sense 7 migration. Uh, and this went from a handful of people that were doing work with these and the rest of the company being fairly skeptical to almost everybody effectively embracing SystemD and wanting to leverage these features and work with it. Uh, and we've done a lot of feature development as well throughout the years. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these in depth because I've given a lot of talks about this before and I link one below there. One thing I do want to highlight though is SystemD Umdi because it's a fairly recent change uh, and it's also something that's coming in Fedora uh, for, for 34. SystemD Umdi is a, is a new kind of user space Umdi killer that leverages P PSI. So the way SystemD Umdi works is that it figures out while your system is running, if there's a process that's about to spill over and you invoke the Umdi killer and it deals with it before that actually happens. So it can act in a much more um, in a much more precise way and it, it avoids bringing down your whole system. Um, this is something we are running in production at Facebook now, um, and it's something that we is already merged in system D upstream as of uh, two for six, I believe, or two for five. Um, yeah, uh, we also have a few other projects that are tangential to system D. Um, back in the Scent, uh, when we started, we started doing Scent 8, we brought some compa libraries to make it possible to run a modern system D, when we start, we're doing Scent 7, sorry. We brought compa libraries to make it possible to run a modern system D on um, on the distribution because the distribution was still using an older version. Uh, this is not terribly relevant this day and it's something we'll probably sunset with nine. Uh, we also have a project called PyStemD that gives you uh, nice, a nice Python abstraction on top of systemd and because it uses Python, it links directly to libsystemd and it, it's very fast and very useful, especially if you want to do operations over dbus. Uh, this is also packaged in both Fedora and Nepal if you want to use it. Um, finally, a few words about packaging. Um, as I said, we use a standard packaging stack. We use RPM and DNF and YAM. Um, because we've been doing this for a while, we found pretty much anything that can go wrong in the packaging stack at this point, and I've dealt with it at some point. Um, in general, when you're operating a fleet as large as Facebook, anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and it will go wrong a lot. So even issues that normally would manifest themselves on like 0.1%, uh, of your machine or in your situation, they, they end up becoming a lot of machines that you have to deal with. Um, with the RPM DB specifically, this was evident when we were still using Berkeley DB because Berkeley DB was fairly brittle and fairly easy to mess up. Uh, and we've wrote a tool set called DC RPM to deal with this situation to identify the state of the RPM DB and remediate corruption and do a bunch of housekeeping around it to try and make things better. This is also open source and it's also packaged in Fedora and it's something you can use today. Um, the other thing we did was work with the community. Uh, the community was already aware of this problem and had developed some alternative RPM databases to test. Uh, at the time, there was LMDB and NDB. Uh, so we took those two, we A-B tested them uh, by effectively putting them on a lot of machines and comparing results. And we ended up switching to NDB from virtual DB. And this all but eliminated RPM DB corruption, as far as we can tell. And this is what we're running to this day on the fleet at Facebook um, everywhere. Uh, there's also some work in progress happening in this space. Uh, the main thing I want to mention uh, is uh, my colleague Matthew Almond's work on leverage ZDF and RPM copy on Bright. The idea here is to use the features that are provided by modern file systems like ButterFS uh, to make package installs much faster, uh, much faster and much less expensive. Matthew gave a talk at Dojo uh, 2021, not 2020, <laughs> two, two weeks ago. Uh, and I linked it there, and that goes in detail on how this works. This has also been proposed as a change proposal for 34, um, although it will, we will punt it to 35 because there's more work needed there. Um, but this is something we're very excited about, and it's something we are currently also running in production and has, has provided a lot of performance improvement. Um, finally, uh, I mentioned the RPMDB before. The community already moved on and now is using SQLite, especially in Fedora for the RPMDB. So we plan to start evaluating that shortly and 
assuming it works just as well as NDB, which I expect uh, will switch over there so we can stay closer and not, not keep a delta if we can avoid it. Okay, uh, there's a few more things that we do um, that, that tend to like not be what you would normally expect if you run bare CentOS. And these are all things we do to either better fit in our environment or better fit with our workload. So for example, if you install Cent8 today, it comes with Cgroup1 by default and it will install on XFS. Um, because we do a lot of work on resource control and we want to leverage these features, by default, we will set up machines with Cgroup2 and we will use ButterFS from the root file system. Um, Cgroup2 and ButterFS combined is important because it's what keeps you working IO control. Um, and that, that is something we use a lot at Facebook all over the place. Uh, we started making ButterFS the default um, with CentOS 8 when we started switching over and it has been a resounding success so far. Um, we were using ButterFS long before that, of course, but it wasn't the default for the Rofel system. We also had a few other minor changes in the, in the infrastructure. We, we incentivize specifically uh, IP table ships without the NF table, without the legacy backend, only with NF tables. Uh, but our kernel folks don't really want to support NF tables for a bunch of reasons. So we rebuilt it with the legacy backend enabled. Uh, on the networking front, historically, we've always used network scripts instead of network manager. Uh, network scripts is the scripts uh, package as part of image scripts, if you're not familiar. It's what used to be the default uh, on CentOS 6 and earlier, I believe. Um, so that's what we still use. Uh, this is likely something we'll reevaluate when we start working on 9. Um, what I suspect we'll end up doing is using systemd network D, but we haven't actually done any evaluation on this yet, so we'll see. Um, again, there's a link to another talk if you want more details about these specific things and why we make the choices we make. Okay, I went fairly fast on that. Uh, and I went fairly fast on that on purpose because the part I wanna focus is actually the part about upstream and upstream contributions. Because I think that's the, that's the interesting and the important bit at this point, the bit that um, when people have talked about it, I don't think it's necessarily well understood in general. So to talk about this, let's take a step back and think about how the distribution is built. Um, and of course, there's diagrams, which hopefully will make sense. So this is, uh, I'll, I'll go over examples of how the distribution is built, starting from CentOS Linux 7. So the way CentOS Linux, and to be clear, I don't work at Red Hat. I've never worked at Red Hat. This is based on public information and my understanding of things. So if something is blatantly wrong, please mention it in the chat and we can talk about it later. Um, so the way CentOS 7 was built is that Red Hat takes Fedora 29, Fedora 19. They took Fedora 19 when it was released and they took a snapshot of it. They took the snapshot of it. They rebuilt the whole distribution with a bunch of special macros so that it comes out as EL instead of Fedora. And then they start actually testing the distribution and working on it. All of this happens inside Red Hat in, a, in effectively a staging distribution that isn't public that I'm sure has a name uh, for the people that work on it. When the staging distribution evolves from like a primordial soup to an actual distribution that people can use, this becomes something that has testing and gating applied. Uh, so when updates are added to it, the updates go through a testing and qualification phase before they then make it out. Then this distribution is what gets shipped as RHEL 7. Uh, when RHEL 7.0 comes out, CentOS Linux 7.0 is built. And CentOS Linux 7.0 is built by taking the sources of RHEL 7 that come out publicly and rebuilding them. It has no input whatsoever from what happened on the stage previous. And then throughout the lifetime of 7, this goes on. So 7.1 also comes out of the staging distribution, which at that point is effectively the same as RHEL. And it's a stable distribution that gets updates. These updates are gated and tested. And then once a bunch of these have been bundled up, it's released together as a RHEL 7.1 and then send us Linux 7.1 and so on. I forgot how many point releases 7 adds, so I just put an X there. Now, if you look at this from a bird's eye view, let's say you want to contribute, you're a CentOS user and you want to contribute to CentOS Linux because say you found a bug in some component in CentOS Linux. What can you do? Well, let's see. You could contribute to CentOS Linux directly, but not really because CentOS Linux is just a rebuild of RHEL. So there, there is no, apart from like logic to do the actual build and some branding changes, there effectively isn't 
anything in CentOS Linux that isn't in RHEL. So you can't really change anything in CentOS Linux because by definition, this doesn't have any deviations from RHEL. So, okay, I guess you could contribute to RHEL, um, but not really because RHEL is a commercial product. Uh, you can certainly file bug reports on RHEL. Uh, and if you file bug reports and attach patches, those might end up to the right person and they might eventually make it to a stable point release down the road. Um, we actually tried doing this back in the day at Facebook. Uh, it took us many months to get a one line fix merged. And this was by uh, pinging people we knew and asking for favors and stuff like that. Um, this is clearly not a viable option. And even if you were running RHEL as a commercial customer and as a support contract and everything, that's still mostly geared towards support, not towards contributing changes and trying to make things better. So you're kind of stuck because obviously you can contribute to the stage in this store because that's internal. The only component you can contribute to in this, in this world is effectively only Fedora. And while you can certainly contribute to Fedora, that's not really gonna help you if you're running CentOS Linux 7 now. That may help you if you plan to move to CentOS Linux 8 or 9 down the road because changes in Fedora eventually trickle down to new major releases, but that's not really gonna help you right now. So you end up doing what we end up doing and a lot of people do, which is where you end up maintaining a lot of logic internally and backwards, and then you try to talk to people and get things fixed via back channels. Um, this wasn't an ideal situation. Um, and, and this is something everybody was well aware of. And this is where strain came in. So let's look at how, what the picture is with eight. Uh, it is actually very similar. Uh, there's two changes you can see here. One is that, well, it's Fedora 28 because the world moved on, but also effectively the staging distribution isn't there anymore. And instead of that, we have CentOS 3.8. And CentOS 3.8 is public now. It is an actual distribution that you can run. It's an actual distribution you can contribute to. And this is a major change because now, well, you still cannot contribute directly to CentOS Linux because obviously it's a rebuild of RHEL. You can contribute to stream. You can follow back reports. You can open pull requests. You can try to get stuff fixed there and it will make it into stream, assuming it passes the testing and the gating uh, and, and the maintainers, of course, thinks the change is not insane. And then from there, it will eventually make it to RHEL and CentOS. So this is a major change because now you suddenly can actually contribute to the distribution. And I want to stress, this doesn't mean the CentOS stream is rawhide for CentOS because it's effectively the same as before with the staging distribution. This is effectively RHEL, except it's not RHEL 8.0, 8.1, 8.0, whatever. It is RHEL with all the updates up to this point where when new code is added, where new packages are added, are packages that have gone through all the gating and testing that they would have gone if they were shipped to customers in RHEL. So it's effectively something that is as stable as RHEL. Um, now, the other difference in this, obviously, unless you've been living under a rock, is that CentOS Linux 8 has been effectively sunset. So at one point, there will be a RHEL 8 point release that won't have a corresponding CentOS Linux. Uh, but CentOS Stream will always be around. Um, now, this is a much better situation because now you can contribute to Fedora if you want to make changes to the new version um, of RHEL and CentOS, but you can also contribute to CentOS 3 now if you want to fix things right now in it and eventually affect the next RHEL minor release. Um, however, there's still a bit of a mismatch here because how do we go from Fedora to CentOS Stream? Uh, effectively, for us and for everybody else, when, when CentOS Stream came out, it was, oh, here's a drop. That's great, but how do you make this? Where did this come from? Um, and that's where I think I think will get interesting when we have nine. So when we have nine, there's another box in there, which is ELN. Uh, and effectively, that's another piece of what used to be internal Red Hat process that now becomes available to the world. I mentioned before that the first thing folks would do when they start building a new version of RHEL is that they'll take Fedora and rebuild it with a bunch of different macros and settings to make it an EL distribution. That's effectively what ELN is doing, except it's not doing it on internal RHEL infra, but it's doing it in the open within Fedora right now. And Fedora ELN is, is a Fedora project. Um, so that also moved a large chunk of this process and tooling out in the open as something you can actually contribute to and inspect and work on. Um, and while the nine cycle, has, well, ELN has started already, but the actual nine cycle, the public one hasn't started yet, um, my expectation is that this will make Nine a much better product and a much easier product to work on and to contribute to as well. 
Um, with nine, CentOS Linux isn't in the picture anymore uh, because it won't be it won't exist anymore as a rebuild of RHEL, at least as a CentOS product. There's gonna be there's most likely gonna be plenty of non non Red Hat and non CentOS product that would do that. Um, but CentOS Stream will be around, and we give you the same guarantees of stability that RHEL gives you as a distribution you can actually contribute to. Um, I linked a blog post there from a former colleague of mine, Phil Libowitz, who went over this extensively and has a lot of diagrams that explain in more detail how this works. And also as references to other talks you may want to watch to better understand it. Um, and I know that every talk that references CentOS Stream in the last few months had this kind of diagrams and stuff. And I, I hope this helped a little bit making things clearer for people that weren't still sure how this worked. So what can you do? So you can contribute to Fedora. Fedora effectively influences what we're going to the next major release. How can you contribute to Fedora? Join the Fedora project and do work there. File bugs, maintain packages, work with maintainers, drive changes. Fedora has a wealth of opportunities for people to contribute, both in Fedora proper and in Appel. And it's an extremely welcoming community that would encourage everybody to work with. Um, if you want to assist in the bring up, of stream, you can work with the LN. I don't actually know very much about the LN besides what's come out in the mailing list and what people have talked to at conferences, but there's a meetup tomorrow. Um, well, today for me, because it's gonna be at midnight here. Um, I highly recommend you join the meetup if you're interested, because I expect that will be a very useful place to have these kind of conversations. Um, and finally, you can also contribute to stream. Stream is now a continuously delivered version of Rattle. Effectively, it's a continuously delivered distribution that tracks the next minor of RHEL. Uh, and it is something you can contribute to. You can file and fix bugs. Uh, you can send pull requests on packages. You can fix things. And you can join a SIG or make a SIG. SIGs are the building blocks of the CentOS community and where all the, all the actual major work happens. Um, so let's talk about what we are doing in Fedora uh, as an example. Uh, we started getting, we've been involved with Fedora on and off for a while. Uh, I say we started getting actually involved with Fedora about a year ago, um, where multiple engineers from Facebook actually started to read the mailing list, to be involved with the project, do actual work there, uh, not just file bugs and stuff. Um, so myself and a bunch of other engineers did, did work to try and get some of our tooling and software packaged within Fedora. Uh, among other things, we got most of our application stack packaged there, uh, not necessarily because we're using it at Facebook, because the way we build our internal software at Facebook is very different, uh, but because we think it is useful to have it out there so that people know it exists. Also, we think it's useful to have it out there because it can, uh, by because Fedora runs on a variety of other architectures, for example, it, we can leverage the fact that it does CI for these architectures and things like that, and we can get feedback on that. And at the same time, um, I don't know if you ever tried building a project that comes out of Facebook or Google or one of these large companies. Um, unless you work there, it is not particularly fun. So my hope is that by these things being actually packaged, people can use them and maybe provide feedback. Um, more directly, we also package tooling that we use in the infrastructure that before we were maintaining internally. Things like DCRPM that I mentioned before, there's really no reason why we wouldn't package those in the distro. Um, we've done uh, feature enablement work, and we started getting involved with Rustic. Uh, we also had several change proposals out, um, starting from 33. With 33, we work with the community to switch Fedora to use ButterFS by default. Um, with 34, we are working to have the standard compression by default, and we are also working to switch from early OOM to systemd OOMD. Uh, I mentioned the DNF copy on write work a moment ago. Uh, that is also something we're working on uh, in the 34 time frame, although that's got deferred to 35 because there are more work. And finally, we're doing work with the Appel Packager 6 to make it easier to get packages branched and updated for Appel when needed. Um, you can find a link to a talk that my colleague Michelle gave at FOSDEM. Uh, Michelle works on the desktop team uh, and he's been helping us a lot working with Fedora. On the CentOS side, we started a SIG. Um, we started a SIG called Hyperscale. Uh, in collaboration with other companies. Um, and the goal for the SIG is to make it easier for large companies like Facebook and Twitter, but really for anybody else that wants to do development work in stream to have a place where they can build packages, packages that may be uh, updates of base, for example, and get them deployed on the infrastructure and 
leverage the upstream tooling here and contribute as much as possible. Um, I'm going a bit faster because I realize I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, we, we are focusing these on a few things. Uh, we're focusing these on package backports. So effectively, the stuff I mentioned before that we currently have in our own repository on GitHub, we would like to move within the SIG um, because we think it would be a lot easier for people to contribute to. And we also think it would make it easier to move changes between Fedora and CentOS and CentOS proper. Um, so these are all things that we are working on right now at various stages. Um, System D is something that we will probably publish next week. Graph is something I started working yesterday. Uh, Dwarfs is a small package we use to actually test this process. Um, other members of the SIG are working on things like LibGirl and REST Demon and a bunch of other packages. We also use this as a space to publish uh, deviations of base packages with different config settings. So I mentioned that we build IP tables, for example, with the legacy backend still enabled. There's not really any reason for not publishing that. So we will have that available in the SIG as well. And finally, for things like the RPM copy on bright work that I mentioned, uh, that work involves rebuilding effectively the entire packaging stack to actually test it. Um, while it is something you could theoretically put in a copper, um, we believe there is use for having a version that is tested and actually deployed in production available somewhere for people to test so it can be tested and used before it actually gets uh, published out uh, and merged in Fedora. There's also some discussions about building an alt kernel for CentOS um, to have better feature enablements for things like ButterFS and Secure 2, but this is still in very early stages and at the discussion stage, so I don't have anything to show for this yet. Right now, however, if you go on git.sendos.org, you can find branches for the SIG on a few packages like systemd, and there is already a package repository you can enable um, if you do the NF install CentOS release hyperscale, and this will give you access to, I think right now there's only dwarfs in there, so it's not terribly useful. But starting from next week, uh, we should also have system D and other things in there. Um, I'll make sure to post on Devel, on CentOS Devel when that happens, so people know it's there. Um, in the near future, we'll have another repository for experimental. And then, as I mentioned, there's kernel work being discussed, and we hope to, at some point, also publish cloud images. Um, OK. I want to say a few words about deployment before I run out of time. Um, I mentioned we use Chef. We've talked about Chef a lot before. Chef does config management. Uh, if you're familiar with Ansible or Puppet, it's effectively the same category of product. I'm going to skip this um, because I think mostly everybody knows how this works at this point. Uh, there are links here to the things that you can use if you're interested in using Chef in your infrastructure with the same model that Facebook uses and with the same tooling. And some of this is also packaged in Fedora. Um, what I think people are more interested in hearing about is how we do updates, um, because that is something that has come out a lot. So we split between minor and major updates. For minor updates, what we do is that we snapshot the repo, um, beat the repo that used to come from CentOS Linux 7 or 8, CentOS 7, 6 or 7, or the repo that comes out of CentOS Stream. Um, and we snapshot it every couple of weeks. And then once we have this snapshot in the repo, we roll it out the fleet over the course of two weeks. And the way we roll it out is that we, we from Chef, we basically just run DNF upgrade uh, with some logic around it and queries, of course, because not sometimes you have to do special things, especially if you have internal packages that are rebuilt and shadowing. Um, so uh, we've done this process in CentOS 6, as far as I remember. Uh, at this point, it works very, very well. And it allows us to do this live on, on live machines running real traffic and real work without any actual impact, all thanks to the binary compatibility that's guaranteed by CentOS. Um, now, this is for minor updates. For major updates, we just reprovision. Um, we've decided long ago that it's not worth the trouble to try and do major updates in place, even if it's technically possible. Uh, we also like the fact that we get a clean slate and that this gives us a watershed event that we can use to also make policy changes if we want to. So for example, when we did 7 to 8, we enable ButterFS by default, and doing that requires wiping the drives. Um, well, yes, effectively, yes. You can do conversion in place, but we weren't going to do that. So things like that are very useful, because if you're going to have to reimage any way to update, you might as well do these things. Uh, and we have tooling uh, that is generally available to do these leveraging maintenance windows. So we can do things like uh, the tooling knows how many machines it can take out at the same time without impacting user services and do this in a safe way. Uh, as I said, we've done this a bunch. 
we did five to six, six to seven. Uh, we are at the tail end of seven to eight right now, and we're going to be doing nine, likely at the end of this year or next year. Um, again, linked to a talk where I talked about how the updates work specifically. Right now, 85% and 0.5 and change, I, as of this morning, is on stream eight. Um, we do have a long tail of seven because you always have a long tail when you join these things. Uh, the long tail right now is things like switches, which, because as, as I said, we, we reimage and reboot. Well, if you reboot the switch, everything connected to the switch goes down. So switches take a while to update because they require extra coordination because you effectively get to offline the entire rack. And yes, the switches at Facebook are just computers that run CentOS. They're nothing special. Um, Storage is a similar thing where for storage, you have special replication constraints. So you can't necessarily take out all of the replicas at once. So that is also something that's taking a bit longer. And finally, containers, um, which are currently still a mix of seven and eight. And we're hoping to make good headways on that this year um, and be done by the end of the year. Uh, coming up, stream nine, uh, which I am eagerly awaiting to see the sources of. This is all I have. And I will happily take questions here if there's anything left. And if there isn't, we'll go on Discord. Thank you.